everyone and welcome to Collider Movie Talk, Movie Talk for Movie Fans. I'm your host, Natasha Martinez, and this is the daily show where we give you all of the latest news in the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Joining me today, as always, is John Campia. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie-related show on the planet Earth, coming to you from right here at the Collider Video Studios here in Burbank, California. And I gotta say this, I'm putting my support behind a movement going on right now. As some of you may know, unfortunately, uh, last week, uh, rock and roll legend Lemmy Kilmster uh, mm -hmm. passed away, and this is true. They have discovered four new heavy metals that they are adding to the periodic table, and there is a petition right now that has over 80,000 signatures on already to name one of them, and they're seriously considering this Lemmium. They are talking about naming one of the new heavy metals that they've called Lemium. I want that to happen, and then I want a guitar made out of Lemium, and then I'm just going to like just play guitar all day. That's I agree with everything you're saying. I read about that movement this morning. Motorhead's legendary Ace of Spades, baby. Let's put it on the periodic table. <laughs> well, you've already done your introduction, Mark Ellis. Oh, I'm Mark Ellis, everybody. <laughs> Thanks for joining and us. And Christian Harloff. <laughs> I I'm so lost right now. I'm just yeah. lost. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Let me. All right, so let's, uh, let's, as happens sometimes, before we get to these wonderful stories in the sidebar, something new dropped. We knew it was coming, didn't know it was going to be this morning, but it did. The first trailer for the new Conjuring 2 dropped this morning. Uh, now, the first one, I think it's safe to say, was a hell of a surprise. I mean, it looked like just another kind of throwaway, low-budget horror. Impressed the hell out of us, no pun intended. Um, and, and so, what would they do for the second one? You watched the first show this morning. What did you think about it? Well, you and I talked about the we talked about Conjuring for a bit yesterday yeah. on the show, and I loved the first Conjuring. And like I said yesterday, I'm not a big horror guy. And when they showed that presentation, I think it, I don't know where it was at WonderCon a couple of years ago, and that oh boy so, yeah. creeped me out, Ooh, man. Yeah. And the way that it was written in and directed by James Wan, I loved it. Second trailer, this new one. Mm. I don't know, just to me it felt, it kind of felt, it didn't have that kind of magic that the first one had to where I, w I wasn't creeped out. It seemed like, like you were just saying, almost a little bit more generic, like something I've seen before. Now I hope I'm wrong. I hope that I go into it and it's, it's as creepy and, it, and the f developing. I just, I don't want it to just be like, oh, the first one's successful. We have to make a sequel. That's kind of what it seems like in the trailer. There weren't, there was nothing that really stood out to me. I'm gonna completely disagree with you. I I am not a huge horror guy. I love myself a good horror film, like I love any genre of film if, if it's good. I I thought this trailer was really effective. I thought it was creepy. I thought it you know it focused on characters as opposed to just jumps. Although there's a there's a good significant jump in there as well. But it was a well used jump at the same time. I felt like all the things that were strong about The Conjuring. I felt like I saw elements of those strengths in the new trailer. So I got to say, for me, it, it has elevated my excitement mm. personally. Yeah, if you're talking about the first movie, and the first movie was like a... This one's like a... It's like a little, <laughs> yeah. like a little golf clap, but it's great to see. My favorite part of this trailer was actually my least part of the, pit, the trailer farted. as well. My least farted trailer <laughs> of 2016 so far. You see director James Wan, right? And his name's scrolling up. It was such a cheesy way, I thought, in the trailer. It just was... From director, yeah. it's like I made it on iMovie from director James Wan, but it also the fact that James Wan is back and doing this and farting once again <laughs> in a haunted house is something that I really want to sign up for. My problem is that I don't really know anything about what this movie is about. Don't give it all away. Just let me know what is going on in this movie because the first one so clearly we had a haunted house. There were kids that were freaked out of their mind. Who believes them if it's real or, real or not? Then this one, it's like, is it more demonic possession? Is it, I don't know what the problem is yet. I just know there's some weird old people in the house. There, there's clearly a problem, though. There's right. clearly, right from the beginning, there's clearly a problem. Yeah, there's an issue <laughs> yes. that we're dealing with. There yeah. is a definite the, the issue. It's going after the Warrens in particular, maybe. Yeah. All right, well, let's get on with our first scheduled story today. Batman vs. Superman is just a few months away now, and director Zack Snyder has been making some rounds and talking about the superhero film, and in particular, Wonder Woman. In the casting of actress Gal Gadot, Snyder said the following, We tested a bunch of actresses, as you can imagine, but the thing with Gal is that she's strong, she's beautiful, and she's a kind person, which is interesting but fierce at the same time. It's that combination of being fierce but kind at the same time that we're looking for, that we were looking for. She can get serious, but she's amazingly fun to be around. When asked if she'll have as much screen time in the movie as Batman and Superman, he said this, no, she has a cameo in the movie. No, actually, it's bigger It's bigger than a cameo. She comes in and does something. Um, 
Well, I, I do find it interesting that, okay, she's fun to be around. She's strong. I noticed he never said talented anywhere. That's, that's kind of interesting. Anyway, <laughs> the, to me, the thing about this particular, um, qu these quotes from Snyder that stand out to me is, I think a lot of us never thought that Wonder Woman was going to have a very big role in this movie. But as the trailers came out, and she's, she's in a, a decent amount of the trailer for a secondary character, I think, I know I myself, I've started to wonder, hey, maybe she's got a bigger role in this movie than I thought. But now hearing Snyder start off by saying, well, she's got a cameo. Uh, okay, it's not a cameo. She actually does something. Maybe that takes us back to the original assumption that we're probably not going to see a lot of Wonder Woman in this. And I think that would be a great thing. Why? Because I don't want to see Wonder Woman. No, 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 not at all. I want to see lots of Wonder Woman later on. I've just, you know me, I've always wanted the absolute big chunk of this movie to be focused on Batman and Superman. That's where I want the lens of this movie to be. Yes, I understand for all those millions of voices crying out, but John, it's also called Dawn of Justice. Yes, I understand that. <laughs> but it's Batman versus Superman. And that's where the focus of this movie needs to be. But John! <laughs> but John! Excuse me! Mr. Cambia! <laughs> yes, you in the Redskins jersey. I agree with you, actually. I, I agree oh. with everything you're saying, other than the fact that it's like, I, I, I didn't like reading these comments simply because if she only has that little scene in there, oh no, she comes in and does something. We've already seen what that something is <laughs> from the trailer. Why would you give that away in the trailer? It makes me even more upset at that last trailer than I already was. I was kind of bummed out already. But yeah, fine. Look, she, she's Wonder Woman. It seems like everybody's confident behind the scenes. That's all these, these comments really indicate to me is that they liked how she was utilized in this movie. And that's good. That's good. Let's look forward to the movie. But again, I'm with you. I want to see Batman versus Superman. Wonder Woman's in it. Great. Let's not make that the focus. Yeah, and I think it's going to be cool when, like, hey, when we see Aquaman pop up on the screen, I think we're all going to get chills. You know, when we get our first glimpse of Cyborg, he won't be Cyborg yet. But when we get our first glimpse, we're going to get chills. When we see Wonder Woman pop on screen, we're going to get chills. And that's all great and wonderful. But, like, I think these quotes have elevated my excitement because I've been getting worried that more and more it's like, oh, actually this movie is less and less about Batman and Superman, more about all this other stuff. And this comment right by itself, and maybe this is unfounded, but I'm, I choose to get excited about it because it tells me that, yeah, they're doing what they should be doing, which is turning the lens, keeping the focus on Batman versus Superman. They're going to introduce elements like Wonder Woman, Aquaman, all the rest, and that's great setting up the other movies, hence your Dawn of Justice. But I'm taking this, I choose to be incredibly enthusiastic about this <laughs> and choose that this is good news. Christian, your thoughts? I agree. I think that it is good news, but I think that it's kind of a mix for both your comments for me. Is that The first part of it, I actually really like when a director comes out and, and is, no, this is why we cast her, this is, this is exactly what we were looking for, and he's, he's behind his, his decision. And, and the casting decision to put her as Wonder Woman. I think that's great to hear him say that. I also agree with Mark very much. So it's like, oh, no, she got a small cameo. Oh, wait, it's not a cameo. She comes in and do something. Oh, you mean fight Doomsday and, and go back and forth <laughs> with jokes? With, with It's right there. And also, she's dancing in a scene or whatever she's doing with, uh, with Bruce Wayne at that one yeah. point as well. So why did they show her that much? If it's a little cameo and we know that she does something, we know what it is already. I, I hope they're wrong. I hope she does something completely different. And we and we, I want us to be on Movie Talk the next day going, everything we thought was gonna happen we, with Wonder Woman, we were wrong. Man, we yeah, thought they showed yeah. us everything and boy, are we a bunch of idiots. Like I, That's what I'm hoping. I'm hoping that we are just jumping the gun and going, oh, why'd they show that? They shouldn't have showed that. And everyone's like, calm down, take it easy. But I. Don't know if that's the case. And, and what elevates these comments from just typical director speak, which is, oh, I really liked working on the project, everybody's really nice, it was cool, is that they're not hiding her. And they're not afraid of her performance in this movie because, again, she just didn't have... We haven't heard her say a word around. yet. Right. We haven't heard her say anything yet. But he's saying all these things, and it's like we're not trying to, to minimize her role in this. We didn't shoot a bunch of scenes with her and then be like, oh, my God, we can't use any of this crap. Let's just throw her in a cameo. They're confident in her performance. That's what I'm reading into these They're comments. definitely common because they wouldn't have greenlit that that Wonder Woman movie, they would have tr tried to scramble and do something else mm -hmm. to figure out a way not to make that Wonder Woman. If she couldn't carry those scenes that she's in in Batman for Superman, there's no way they go and cra uh, cast Chris Pine and then so oh, let's start pro there's the production in it already, right? Haven't they started shooting? They've started shooting. They started the movie, shooting yes. already. So you've got to have enough confidence to where she can be in the lead movie. Sure, you got Chris Pine and you know now you have some other star power right beside her. But if she was terrible in this movie, just terrible. They're not green light in that movie. I think now you're the one being overly optimistic. But that that being said, <laughs> I, I disagree with both of you on the on My the case John! <laughs> on the case of that's like seven times a day around this office, ladies and gentlemen. Seven times a day. 
<laughs> so I actually think even if, even if, and we don't know that what we saw of her in the trailer is all that we're going to see from her, but even if it was, let's remember this. Wonder Woman is the single most iconic female superhero ever in history. Stop, period, no further sentences necessary. I don't care if you like Storm. I don't care if you like anybody else. There's no debate. Wonder Woman is the most iconic female superhero of all time. And if she's making her big screen debut in this film, then you feature her in the trailer. Now, do I think they should have shown that shot with her standing with Batman and right. Superman facing us? No, but like in that first trailer, we got we saw shots of Wonder Woman as well. I so even if that's all she's is, all she does in the movie, I still think it was the right move to show it because it's like it's the most iconic female superhero right. ever. You got to show that off. And so. I don't think you, you you hide her in the trailer. I just think that scene where she she pretty much it looks like she's saving Bruce Wayne and Clark Kent from, the, Kent the from Doomsday. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't need to see all of that. Right. No, I don't no, hide I her agree. in the trailer. I, agree, I yeah. like that they're using her as a vehicle to sell the movie. Just don't show me the actual scene that she's in yet. Hashtag Butt John. <laughs> no, I, you have, you have no, you have no idea in the chat board how much has been hashtag Butt John. Ah, I'm gonna be hearing this all day. It's all a right. new one. It's the, it's the new uh, get filthy or whatever. All right, bring on the <laughs> All right what's next? We all saw it coming, but now it's official. Star Wars The Force Awakens has passed Avatar to become the number one all-time domestic box office champion. The film passed the $760 million mark to break the record James Cameron's Avatar has held on to for six and a half years. Having already set just about every other box office record, the only relevant one remaining is the all-time worldwide record still being held on to by Avatar. Avatar has just under $2.8 billion, while The Force Awakens currently sits in fourth with over $1.55 billion. Mark, now that The Force Awakens is the number one all-time domestic champ, does it change your position on if it can actually catch the worldwide title? Also, should we expect the same kind of success from the other Star Wars films? Well, let, let's just start with crowning the achievement of being the all-time most money-making yes. movie here in yes. the United States. Go ahead and put on a Burger King crown Star Wars because <laughs> you deserved it, and I'm happy to see that. It's so much harder to predict how the worldwide box, box office is going to turn out because I don't even know if this movie has opened in China yet. Today, or if it's, it opens today, yeah. we know it's that it's the last market to open it. And and they, they did a big marketing push in China. Huge they, yeah. push. They, 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 they yeah. did huge. There's billboards. They, they turned two buildings into two lightsabers. I don't know if the, the the appetite in China for Star Wars is anywhere near what it is. I don't believe it is as much as it was here anyway. But maybe the tide turns with this movie. I love this movie, so I'm happy to see it beat Avatar. But you got to do 1.3 billion dollars more of business. I don't know that you can reach that number. I don't think it has to. I still am going to stick with my original optimism and say, yes, yeah, somehow it's going to eke it out. The future Star Wars movies, on the other hand, I don't think are going to. I don't think that Episode 8 or Episode 9 are going to be able to do it. I certainly don't think Rogue One is going to be able to match the box office records for Star Wars because, like we talked about the day of the premiere, we're never going to see a movie event like this in our entire lives. Avatar was such an anomaly that it just kept on rolling and getting business both here and worldwide. Star Wars The Force Awakens was the ultimate comeback for a franchise that we so desperately wanted. You're never going to have that feeling again. These movies that are coming out could be great. I just don't think that they're going to be all-time contenders just yet. Christian? Uh, I agree. I don't think that episode eight or nine are going to be able to do the money that seven did. And I also was going through the, the list yesterday and you looked like episode five is so far behind episode four and, and like episode one, episode two is so far behind episode one. And the sequels just, they do well. They do really well. But I agree 100% is that there's this buildup and this feel and this magic that was waiting to see what was coming since episode six that we're not getting that type of feeling again because then we're all, and this movie's gonna be out in like a year and a half, episode eight anyway. So I think it'll do really well, but these type of numbers, I don't know. Now, as far as catching Avatar, I am also sticking with my guns, but it's I might change my tune after I see what the China intake is. Well, I mean, mm -hmm. that's that's the, the magic bullet here, right, yeah. is China. Because uh, look, if, if I've said all along, I don't think Star Wars can catch Avatar's worldwide box office, but, if Star Wars can open in China, and the the projections I'm hearing aren't optimistic, but if it could open in China, I think you might have brought this up yesterday. I'm not sure, but if China, if China, if it can make 600 million in China, now remember the all-time box office record in China is 390, but if it can make like 600 million, I think it's got a fighting chance. I really do. So that's real. We, we're now just sitting waiting for China. 
I think 600 million in China though is a stretch. And I think even if it does hit 600 million in China, that still leaves you with about 800 million more dollars right. you got to make elsewhere. Uh, I think we're about to see Star Wars take a big dip in the North American box. I, th I think it's probably going to make around eh, 75 maybe this weekend, maybe 70. Um, which makes making another 800 million on top of what it can make in China a very tall order. As far as whether it can match the success, the, the future Star Wars movies can match the success. I agree with both of you. I, it It's unlikely because not only did you get Star Wars, but it's Star Wars is basically, for lack of a better term, it's this coming out party. I mean, it's, it's back. It's its announcement. I'm here now. Right. And that magic that we felt at that opening night, being there on that carpet and with that that crowd, it was a bigger event than the Oscars. They shut down more blocks in Hollywood than they do for the Oscars for this thing. So let's look at the first one coming up, Rogue One. I'm so excited for Rogue One, but you're not gonna have trailers with Han Solo saying Chewie were home. You're not gonna see Luke Skywalker in the trailer. You're not gonna see R2-D2 or C-3PO, though I suppose it's a possibility. Might see Vader. I mean, we might see Vader. <laughs> and I'm telling you, like the Wonder Woman thing in Batman vs Superman, if Vader is in this movie, at some point you're gonna see a lot of Vader yeah. in that marketing because that's gonna be the connective tissue, right? But I just don't think that's the case, no matter how good the movies are. And let's remember, they don't have to equal what Star Wars The Force Awakens did at the box office to be incredibly successful. If Rogue One comes out, makes $350 million domestically and like $850 million worldwide, believe you me, Lucasfilm and Disney are jumping up and down and swimming in pools of money because that would be considered a massive success. Episode eight will be bigger than Rogue One. Absolutely will. But again, I agree with both of you guys. I don't think it can catch what what's episode seven does, nor does it need to. Yeah, and Rogue One's going to get some confused people in there as well, too, thinking that, it, that it's episode eight. <laughs> uh, uh, but, but I also, I think that what Force Awakens will also do is it's going to be the first movie in history to make a billion dollars domestically. Like that, like if it make that that alone would be something that I don't know will ever be touched. It could get there. I mean, eighty eight million dollars last weekend, and if it can do somewhere close to that this weekend, it's got a great shot. I think the one record that I do think could be in trouble for Force Awakens with other Star Wars movies threatening it is the opening weekend numbers. Because look, Episode Eight. I don't think Rogue One's going to touch it, but Episode Eight comes out. It's a summertime movie this time. Mm -hmm. it, everybody wants to see it opening weekend because there's so many other movies coming out soon in summer. Oh, that's a good it point. It could threaten it. I, I mean, 200 and what, 40, 45 48? million, whatever it was. Yeah. That's a lot of jack. I don't okay? think they get the pre-sales that Force Awakens has got, though. No, 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 no. Yeah. But I'm saying the opening weekend numbers is the one that I don't think it's going to do the domestic run that it will because that's what hampers it is the fact that it is opening in summer and you do have so much competition coming two or three weeks sure, later. Gonna be but opening, opening weekend, weekend, it could touch but Didn't it. the pre-sale numbers add into the opening weekend? They do. They do. Yes. Yeah. That's what I'm well, to. yeah, I mean, if you bought them for opening weekend, it, it factors into whatever True. day you bought yeah. the right. tickets. So. All Let's right, see. what's next? A few days ago, we discussed a report that had surfaced online suggesting that the Netflix series Daredevil would debut its second season on March 25th, the exact same day as Batman vs. Superman is going to be released. However, a new promotional spot for Daredevil has just come out revealing that the show will actually debut on March 18th. John, you said you never believed that initial report anyway, but do you think the execs at Warner Brothers are relieved Daredevil isn't opening against it? Yeah, generally speaking, we don't cover television stories here, but this is directly connected to a movie story that we did the other day because remember that report came out saying, oh, they're going to open Daredevil against Batman versus Superman. And we said on this table, we do not believe that's the case. But even if it was the case, I never thought for a second that it would affect the box office returns of Batman v, v Superman. Why? Because Netflix releases all their episodes all at once. I can come home at any, like, I could go see Batman vs. Superman, come home, sit down, and watch all 10 episodes of the new Daredevil season. So, really, I didn't think it was going to affect it. That being the case, no, I don't think Batman v Superman or the execs at Warner Brothers are caring either way. I don't think that they cared that they're not opening on the same day. I don't think they would care if they were opening on the same day. I do think that the execs at Netflix are releasing this movie so close to Batman vs. Superman, or releasing this season two of Daredevil so close to Batman vs. Superman, is to capitalize on the superhero hype and momentum. I think they want to piggyback in, in a NASCAR term, and I don't watch NASCAR, but they're, what's it called, drafting? It's called drafting. Drafting. Okay, they're going to try to, you're in a Redskins jersey, you probably know this. Robin's racing. They want to, they're trying to probably draft a little bit on the momentum and the marketing and the, and the you know, pop cultural hysteria of superhero films right now. Uh, because of that, and that's a smart move. That is a smart thing to do. 
All I know is that I am super stoked to see both of these things. I cannot, That is going to be a great eight days for John Campion, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to have Batman versus Superman coming out, season two of Daredevil. I'm going to. You're. I'm not going to have a lot of hygiene. So anyway, Christian, <laughs> I agree with you 100. percent I think that that is exactly what it is. That Daredevil is. That's when it's coming out. Put it out a week before. Get all. Go after the hype. Release it, and I think it's going to do real. And because, like you said, for Netflix. Even if you don't watch it the opening weekend, and when Batman vs Superman, maybe you haven't seen Daredevil before, and then you're so hyped up because you just got to see these two iconic uh, superheroes fight, and then you're like, well, wh what other superhero things did I get into? Watch Daredevil. Really, it's good. Yeah, I'll check <laughs> it out. And you watch one, and then you watch two, and then you know that the Punisher's coming. So it's it's a smart move to put it there. I don't think that the Warner Brothers executives thought about it at all. I think that it's it, it's like you said, you can, Netflix isn't competing with it because it'd be silly. Like, well, I'm not going to go see Batman vs Superman because I'm going to choose to watch this thing that I could pause and play anytime I want. It's like, what are you doing? Go well, that's see what Shep was saying too. Yeah. Right? It's like, okay, so at five o'clock you get home from work, watch three episodes of Daredevil, then go watch Batman Superman, come back and watch the rest you of Daredevil. You can watch it before yeah. you see Batman vs Superman in yeah. the theater. Put on headphones, watch it, then wait for it to start, <laughs> then push pause, watch the movie, then hit unpause on your phone. If they really wanted to go toe to toe with Batman v Superman, you released Daredevil season two, and it's only available the opening weekend <laughs> of Batman <laughs> right, right. Superman. They pulled off Netflix in 48 yeah, that's hours. That's right, yeah, but go back to your uh, NASCAR analogy for a minute is <laughs> that what, what this is doing is it's actually going in front of Batman v Superman, which is smart because not only are you capitalizing on the wave of superhero hype, you're not going to compare yourself to Batman v Superman oh, retroactively. Yep. Right. So now we can see Daredevil first, and it helps Marvel because you can see Daredevil Season 2, and if Batman v Superman is any sort of a letdown in the slightest, you're going to have a lot of people on social media saying, man, Daredevil is beating Batman yeah. right now. We're not going to be surprised if Batman v Superman is better than Daredevil. At least I won't be. But I would be a little shocked to see this Netflix TV series be better than one of the most hyped comic book movies of all time. You know, I, I should make a note here. I think a new record was just set on Movie Talk. I have now caught myself twice saying to Mark's comments, good point. That's twice I said that this episode. has got to be a record. All right, folks. Mom, are you watching today? <laughs> Mom, turn on the computer. She turned on. But right, John! <laughs> I was going to say something, but I won't. All right, folks, we've reached that part of the show now for Buy or Sell. Here's how this works. In front of her, Natasha's got a few other items in the world of movie news. She's going to run them down. And those of us at the table are something going to say whether we buy it or sell it. So, Natasha, what do we got? Okay. As some of you may know, DreamWorks and 20th Century Fox are releasing their new animated film, Trolls, in November of this year. Now, the studios have released the official voice cast of the musical cartoon. The animated movie will feature Justin Timberlake as the troll branch, in addition to serving as executive music producer and performing multiple songs on the soundtrack, Anna Kendrick as Princess Poppy, the late show host James Corden as Biggie, comedian Russell Brand as Creed and music superstar Gwen Stefani as DJ Suki. Setting out on an epic adventure that takes Poppy and Branch far beyond the only world they've ever known, their quest will test their strength and reveal their true colors, with no shortage of musical mashups along the way. Christian, buy or sell the look of Trolls. I like the cast. I like the cast a lot, and I think that it's uh, it could be a lot of fun. Um, I'm very interested to see what they do with Gwen Stefani, because I know she tried to act like in one movie a long time ago. It wasn't bad. I forget what the movie was, but then she... Oh, it was a good movie too. Yeah. And, uh, I'll, I'll figure I figured what it was, yeah. but she, but whatever she was in, she was she was fine in, and she just never acted again. And I know she, in the voiceover and having her singing is probably a smart move. Um, but the trolls could be is something along the lines that it could either be a lot of fun or it could be a disaster. You remember the the gnomes. Was it Nomeo and Juliet? Nomeo and Juliet, <laughs> yeah. Um, I like Nomeo I, and Juliet. I got a, Elton was, John music? It yeah. was great. It was fine, but I'm just saying it didn't, wasn't a huge success. So it's a matter of if the songs are good, if the songs are memorable, and if they can put together a, you know, a movie. These movies have to have heart. And I don't want to just have gags, but I, it, I think it's got potential. Well, that's the fear, is that it could be Nomeo and Juliet, which was a really good movie, but it wasn't a known property, so not as many people saw it, whereas you have the Smurfs, which everybody knows <laughs> and has heard of, and those movies just suck really, really bad. Trolls, I think it's got a lot of potential because of the cast involved. I love Justin Timberlake as the lead. That's the perfect role for him, not out of time or whatever the hell that stupid sci-fi action movie was. <laughs> this is where he should be. And these are the trolls that are like... You know, the like good luck troll dolls, right? Yeah. That's, the, that's with what the, we're with the poofy yeah. purple hair. So who yeah. are, who's going to be playing the rollerblading troll? That was always the coolest <laughs> one. Before Pop Toys ever came out, before Beanie Babies, everybody wanted a rollerblading troll. You know what might steal this movie? James Corbin. 
Dude is really, oh, really he's funny. Great. He's got a great yeah, voice to go along with whatever troll he's playing. So that could be not Russell Brand, which who I like, but James Corbin is the guy to keep an eye out for. You know, a, a lot of us at this table had issues with that uh, film Into the Woods, but I think all of us would agree James Corbin was mm -hmm. really, really good. He might have been the he might have been the best part of the movie. He was a revelation yeah, to me. Yeah. Like I was like, who is this guy? Yeah. And, and yeah, and he really stole the show. Uh, by the way, it's Avatar or Avatar uh, Aviator. Oh right, uh, Aviator, Aviator for right. Gwen Stefani. Right. Um, I really do. Like the sounds of this, and you're look. I'm not a big fan of Justin Timberlake as a theatrical actor, but this is a perfect thing for him. Also, it's kudos to them for getting him to come on as the executive music producer. So all the music you hear now, you know it's going to have a lot of pop to it. It's going to have a lot right. of fun to it. I like this voice cast. I think this is going to be a nice eclectic mix. So for me, it's a buy. All right, what's next? As many of you already know, director Steven Spielberg is currently working on his new film, Ready Player One, based on the massively popular novel. According to a story in The Hollywood Reporter, Bloodlines and Rogue One, a Star Wars story actor Ben Mendelsohn has been made an offer and is currently in negotiations to appear in the film. Set in the near future, Ready Player One follows outcast teenager Wade Watts, who escapes from his bleak surroundings by logging into the Oasis, a globally networked virtual utopia where users can lead idyllic alternate, li alternate, alternate lives. <laughs> when the eccentric billionaire who created the Oasis dies, he offers up his vast fortune as the prize in an elaborate treasure hunt. Along with gamers from around the world, Wade joins the adventure and quickly finds himself pitted against powerful corporate foes and other ruthless competitors who will do anything in the Oasis or the real world to reach the treasure first. Mark, buy or sell Ben Mendelsohn joining Ready Player One. Well, you know, folks, about eight months ago on this very show, show I guaranteed that I would get the book of Ready Player One and read it. Well, that hasn't happened yet. You got the book. <laughs> Probably never will. I did see you looking at it in Barnes & Noble, though. Very, you did look at the book. I was very confused by it, <laughs> by all these little black things on this otherwise white page. I didn't get it. But the movie sounds really good, and Ben Mendelsohn as an addition. you got to think he's playing one of those corporate slime balls, right? Which I don't really care if he's... I don't get whatever role he's in, I trust them, but I don't mind Ben Mendelsohn being sort of pigeonholed in these kind of roles, whether it's the, the weird brother in Bloodline or any of these other things, probably a bad guy in Rogue One because he's just so damn good at it. So adding talent like this to a prospect that I'm already excited about, plus Steven Spielberg behind the camera, this movie could knock your socks off, man. I'm not going to read the book. I'm not going to read <laughs> Give me book, back my but copy. I'm really looking forward to it. I, uh, I, have, I, have, yes. I, have, I have also not read the book, but I have several of my friends that have, like, for the last two or three years been telling me, you got to read Ready Player. And Anne actually just ended up reading, and she loved it. Yeah. She said it was great. And I actually listened to a little bit of as uh, as well with a friend of mine who had it, the audiobook edition. And it sounds like it's pretty cool, but look, it's Steven Spielberg. And it's what we always say. It is never a mistake to add talent. Ben Mendelsohn is big talent. So adding him to something like this sounds great. So for me, it's a buy. I love what has been happening over the last couple of years with movies like this and, and Marvel and DC and Star Wars and adding these Oscar caliber type actors to yeah. and not just movie stars like I love that they're doing this now and of course I buy Ben Mendelsohn in this thing like he he was he was great in Bloodline which I think was some of his best work but I also really loved him in Place Beyond the Pines and that to me is a that's a kind of role I'd like to see him do in this because I think it's a little too we know he's gonna be evil in Rogue One at least we think he will be but I mean <laughs> you figure it but I'd like to see him maybe not and go against stereotype and maybe be someone like in Place Beyond the Pines mm -hmm. where he still had a kind of a shady history but he's helping Ryan Gosling out maybe he's that type of character in this movie but yeah him paired up with Steven Spielberg it'll get his name out there his face more big buy all right what's next a few days ago, we revealed a new poster for the upcoming John Favreau-directed film, The Jungle Book. Now, the full version of that poster has come out, which you can see here. After a fearsome tiger threatens his life, Mowgli, a boy raised by wolves, leaves his jungle home, guided by a stern panther, voiced by Ben Kingsley, and a free-spirited bear, voiced by Bill Murray, sets on a journey of self-discovery. The, the Jungle Book hits theaters on April 15th. John, buy or sell this wide poster for The Jungle Book. Yeah, we told the story a few times but I mean back at D23 man when when John Favreau came out and they said this is probably the most technologically advanced film ever made we all went like yeah okay John sure sure you're doing the jungle book for heaven's get sake get to Star Wars <laughs> yeah that right. was basically all of us we're like get to the Star Wars stuff that's right. all we were doing and then it came on and we all looked at each other dumbfounded about how good this movie looks like it I almost can't even explain it you're just gonna have to see it and this poster to me is 
Wonderful. Like we talked about the King Louis part the other day and wait till you hear Christopher Walken voice King Louis. <laughs> I only heard him say one line, but it was enough to sell me on the movie. Just the one line. I cannot wait to hear Idris Elba's Shere Khan. He's going to be perfect yeah. for this. But the look, and just remember, when you watch the trailer again, remember what they said. Everything you see in this movie was shot on a green screen stage in Los Angeles. It will blow your mind. I love the look of this. It features all the characters you need to feature. It's beautiful. It's gorgeous. So I love this thing. For me, it's a buy. Huge buy for me as well, too, because the thing is that the little trailer that came out that everyone saw was really good. Oh, it was really good, yeah. was garbage compared to the one we saw at D23. Yeah. It, the D23 <laughs> one really showed, I mean, you just hear Baloo whistle the bare necessities at the end, but you see him talking and, and the way that they do it, it's like, okay, they're going full fledged, just like that Disney, the, the classic Disney animation, they're gonna, they're, they're gonna pay homage to it the same way that they did with Cinderella. And, yeah. and I think that this poster captures everything that I wanna see that I saw in that D23 featurette. So. Uh, Huge buy. It looks photoshopped to me. There's no way you got all those animals to pose <laughs> together without getting in some sort of fight. That's how realistic this movie's going to look, I think. From the footage we saw, from the way this poster looks, I am so excited about Blue and Sher Khan and King Louie and whatever the Panthers name. What's it? Bagheera. Fred? Yeah, Bagheera. Bagheera. Fred. Yeah, there you go. Who are the things way off in the background, though, is wolves. my question. The, the wolves. The wolves. The wolves. They raised, they raised him. Mowgli. So yeah. they're just kind of keeping an eye on him. Well, well, no, have you not jungle? seen the Jungle Book? I have. It has been a minute. Like, like I used yeah, to love the Jungle Book. It has been a long I just, time. I, my daughter I loves it. I watched. Mowgli was raised by wolves. Yeah. I didn't know that you actually saw a lot of wolves in the movie, though. So it, they're in the actually in the animation. They're in it for the beginning, and then they kind of have Bagheera take him off into the adventure. What about you, Natasha? Have you do as a kid like the rest of us? Have you ever watched the Jungle Book like the original oh, animated? Yeah. I love the Jungle. I mean, anything Disney, I love. But Jungle Book, um, especially the scene with all the monkeys and dancing with Mowgli, yes. like I can't wait to see it. I love. Love when Disney does this, does the live um, depictions of it all. So just seeing this poster, it looks amazing. And one of the things that was highlighted on the D23 footage was that scene. Oh yeah, with all the monkeys and King Louie and all that kind of. I, I like. I'm literally getting chills <laughs> thinking about. It. Well, look, actually, you know what? Over a year ago, and this movie's been in production for a long time. Over a year ago, we got invited to actually go down to the set of The Jungle Book and visit and see how it's all going on. Now, we're going to reveal more and more about that set visit. But uh, Ashley, who is not here today, I was a little bit... So we sent Ashley down. And you can actually see Ashley right in the middle top of the picture. <laughs> you can see Ashley there on set talking to the That's star cool. of the film there. But she was there for an entire day hanging out and talking with John Favreau and stuff like that. And I asked Ashley if she would sit down and talk to us a little bit about her set visit there. So here's my conversation with Ashley talking about her set visit to The Jungle Book. Well, hey, guys, so Movie Talk viewers. I'm sitting, of course, with Ashley Mova. Hey, guys. And, uh, you know, the new movie, The Jungle Book, is coming out. And... This was a movie that's kind of been on our radar because it's The Jungle Book and John Favreau is directing. That's cool. But it wasn't until D23 when they showed us the first piece of footage that it really got the buzz going. And I had totally forgotten. <laughs> I had totally forgotten that like in 2014 or something, we sent you. Right. You actually got to go down to the set of The Jungle Book. I did. Book. I did. Now, for, for people who might have seen the trailer yeah. for The Jungle Book, you think, oh, where was set? Was it in you know, Bolivia or Peru I or know, right? anything like that? But where was the set visit? It was in downtown Los Angeles. How crazy is that? I know. That is nuts. He goes, at, at D23, one of the things that John Favreau said when he came out, before they showed the footage, he goes, remember, guys, what you're about to see, everything you're, that's in this movie was shot in a soundstage in Los Angeles, which it's is like, insane. What? It's crazy. It's crazy. And just to see it all in front of your face it's it's surreal it's crazy so what was it like being down there on set like what was what were some of the best things you remember seeing there are some of the things that just kind of blew your mind the most i mean obviously it was so cool to just be there because jungle book is something i've known since i was a kid yeah. so to, to get to see this remaking of this story that i know kind of in a different way was really exciting and obviously I just I was in a room with john favreau like <laughs> who gets to say that well, what, i get to what say was, that what was favreau like he was so chill. I was expecting him to come out with like his Starbucks cup and his sunglasses and be like, hey guys, I'm John Favreau. Ugh, I guess <laughs> you guys can sit over there and like I'll be over here and I won't even talk to you. He was so normal and so down to earth. It blew my mind. He was hanging out with us the whole time, talking to us like so normal, answering every question we had. He's, he basically spent the entire day with us. It was crazy. How much time were you down there on set? 
Um, I want to say it was a couple of hours and he was so open to answering every single question that we had. It was, it was truly amazing. And we got, I should have brought these coins. We got these really cool coins that say the jungle book. Hey, <laughs> yeah, I was excited about that. Um, but he was just such a nice guy. What was the one thing that maybe Favreau said during that time, whether it was a question or something he just volunteered himself? What's the one thing that he said about the movie that kind of stands out to you the most or that you remember the most? Uh, it's rough to say because you're not supposed to give away um, technical, like the technical stuff, stuff right. but just when you see this movie, it's it's really gonna blow your mind the way these animals come to life. And him explaining the process, the way he the way they created these animals, it's it's really. I wish I could reveal more, but just him explaining basically. We'll probably be able to reveal more as we get a little we closer. We will, to the movie. we will. Um, but just his explanation of these characters and the cast. This this voice cast is fire. I pulled up the IMDb page just to like read off something. Lupita Nyong'o, Scarlett Johansson, Idris Elba, um, Bill Murray, Ben Kingsley, Christopher like, Walken. Crazy! Like I don't even. And the way these voices fit into these characters, we got to see some of it put like all together it's just it's spot on like the casting for these voices is i mean how can you go wrong with a cast like this but the voices are so perfect for each role i remember at d23 when the, when we heard uh king louis mm -hmm. and it's christopher walken mm -hmm. doing the voice me uh, i'm the king i do a so... terrible christopher walken but i remember <laughs> nice thinking, try oh my nice try god it was so perfect it was so perfect so it, was, it was awesome to see it come to life it was really weird because like jungle book for me before d23 was one of these eh, it's gonna be like every year Disney puts out great movies but mm -hmm. every year one or two of them are just kind of throwaway mm -hmm. movies and I, I just assumed that that Jungle Book was gonna be one of those especially since there's another Jungle yeah, Book movie coming out right? with Andy Serkis directing but I'm telling you I, they showed Star Wars stuff they showed Doctor Strange stuff they showed Captain America stuff but the thing just about everybody was buzzing the most about coming out of D23 was that Jungle Book stuff which yeah. just looks so crazy it does look so crazy and it's kind of it even just from the trailers, you can see, it seems like it's gonna be kind of a darker take on it, which is gonna be, the, just the color palette alone in itself just seems darker. And this kid, we're not supposed to talk about too much, but this kid just seems like- Who plays has, Mowgli. Yes, he has such a career ahead of him. He was so adorable on set. He, his parents were there and they were obviously so proud of him. <laughs> um, and he was talking about his audition process. And he was saying about how when he heard that they were casting, he asked his mom and dad, like, mom, dad, can I go audition for this role? And they're like, OK, you can try. You can try. And then he was like, how is that for a try, mom and dad? When he booked it, I was like, yes. And how old is this sass. kid? I don't know. I think he's probably like 10 years old. Wow. But he has such sass and charisma and confidence. Like, he is... He is going to own this role. It was funny because at D23, when he came out on stage, you had Lupita Nyong'o and you had Ben Kingsley, uh -huh. Sir Ben Kingsley there, oh, right? Yeah. And both of them just fawned over this kid. Like, you just tell they love this kid. So yeah. I cannot wait to learn Every more. time well, they'd end a scene, his name was Neil. And every time they ended a scene, he'd be like, nailed it. Like, you're so cute Are you and clever. Serious? He's adorable. Yeah. So you actually got to watch him shooting some scenes, yeah. too. Yeah, yeah, Oh, that's amazing. Well, yeah. look, they're... There's more about Neil to yeah. talk about. There's a lot about the technical aspects yep. to talk about, which we will get into a little bit later. But thank you for giving us that personal introduction to it. We will have more videos coming up in the coming months with Ashley telling us more about her sad mm -hmm. visit to the Jungle Book. So keep you guys, your eyes open for that. So thank you again, Ashley. No probs. And we'll talk to you guys soon. First report coming from Ashley about her visit to the set of The Jungle Book. You're going to see some more of that coming from her pretty soon. Well, folks, now it is that time of the show for Mailbag. Listen, if you've got a topic or a question you'd like us to address on the show, just email it in to collidervideo at gmail.com. We always take one or two questions Monday through Friday Movie Talk, but we also take a whole bunch of them on the weekends on our Mailbag show on Saturdays and Sundays, so send on in your questions. Now, for those of you watching us live right now, we're going to save a little bit of time after Mailbag to take some of your live Twitter questions. So if you're watching us live right now, jump on Twitter, make sure you're following us at Collider Video, and tweet on in some questions, and Natasha will pick a couple out. But for now, let's get to the Mailbag. So Natasha, what do we got today? All right. Brenda Vokovich writes, Hi, Movie Talk crew. Okay, I know how excited you guys are for Batman vs. Superman, so I was wondering why you haven't talked about that review that leaked online. I looked through the shows for the last week or so and have haven't seen you guys discuss it. Why is that and what do you think of the review? Yeah, so for those of you fortunate enough to not know what, <laughs> what the question is talking about, 
So uh, about a week or, or so ago, somebody got on Reddit, which is a very exclusive thing. Very few people can get on Reddit and post anything uh, and sarcasm. So anybody can go on Reddit and post anything they want. Somebody went on Reddit and claimed that, it, by the way, this is an anonymous, unverified, nobody knows who this person is, person, random person hopped on uh, Reddit and posted that they saw Batman vs Superman and they, they loved it and all this kind of stuff. Oh, good. Yeah, well, oh, I mean, well, there oh, we go, that's right? A it was one of the there studio executives that gave it a standing ovation. Yeah, one of the <laughs> studio executives. And, you know, then some people saying, oh, have been emailing and tweeting me and whatever, saying, why have you not been talking about this? So one single, unverified, totally anonymous guy randomly hops on Reddit and writes whatever he wants, and that's supposed to be a story? Really? It reminds me a lot, go back about a year or a little bit more than a year ago, remember when it came out that, hey guy, and I believe it was also on Reddit. I believe it was on Reddit. There's, guys, this image just appeared on Reddit. And you got that image there, Dennis? Let's bring that up. Okay, there it is. This image appeared yeah. on Reddit. <laughs> guys, Batman versus Superman is being split into two parts. The part one sounds like a gay porn movie, Enter the Night, and the second part <laughs> is going to be called Dawn of Justice, and it, the first one's coming up, and everybody got all excited, and I remember at the time telling everybody, this is, wait a minute, so just somebody, we don't know who, posted this picture on Reddit, and we're supposed to believe this is real, and so many people, you, you wait and see, Campia, it, well, you know what they said. But John, but John, <laughs> it looks so real. Everybody's telling me, oh no, John, it's real. This is going to be real. They're going to split in half. And sure enough, they, they, they didn't. This is the exact same situation. Some random anonymous dude hops on Reddit and writes something. And we're supposed to, everybody's supposed to run around and write this as a story. Now, let's go one step further. Let's say, for argument's sake, that this unverified anonymous random person did actually see Batman versus Superman. Let's go there for a second. They didn't, but let's say that they did. Okay, for argument's sake, let's say that they did. Number one, this is obviously an honorless piece of shit, this person, because <laughs> if they did get in, if they were allowed into a screening, then they went in on their word that they wouldn't go out and start spreading stuff around about the movie. And so if this person is real, then they're an honorless piece of shit because then they, you know, Warner Brothers was clearly kind enough to let them see the movie and then they became a little dirty backstabber and hopped online to write about it. So. Why would I want to listen to anything that person said anyway? But even aside from that, if this person is real, and if they did see Batman versus Superman, which is within the realm of possibility, for all I know, this single anonymous person thinks We Are Your Friends with Zac Efron was the greatest film of 2015. They might think it is the, like the greatest film ever. I don't know. Because... But John! <laughs> exactly. I, so, I mean, so why? First of all, it's probably completely fake. There's nothing to back it up, much like that Batman v Superman graphic. And even if it is real, why would I care? Why would you care? Why would any of us care um, about it whatsoever? So that's why there's, there's a thousand different reasons why when that thing came up, we looked and said, no, this is not a story. This is not anything, so we just let it lie. This happened with The Force Awakens as well, too. There was a guy that said, I've seen The Force Awakens. I remember that I've now. seen it twice. And people, people ask the same and, question, and why are you talking like, why, about and, this? And the thing was, I was like, well, you know, just in case this guy has seen it, I'm going to wait. And I read this guy's review of it after I saw The Force Awakens all wrong. Everything he said happened in the movie didn't. So <laughs> that's why we didn't report it, because it's garbage. I gotta be honest. I, I think I still think you guys are crazy. Like we, it's like it's almost like <laughs> it's almost crazy. like the movie Enter the Night didn't come out this past October because <laughs> right. it was huge. I saw it opening night, loved it. None of you guys wanted to talk about it on the, every day. I came in here, trying, we gonna talk about it in the night. Right. It's like I haven't seen. It. I don't know what you're talking about. How can you not know what I'm talking about? It was great when Yahoo Serious and Polly Shore square off against Dolph Lundgren at the end. It was phenomenal. Great movie. Love Enter the Night. Can't wait for D of J. Yeah, so like I said, is, is it within the realm of possibility that this is real? Of course it is within the realm of possibility, but even if it is, and that's a 2% chance, even if it is, it's still an irrelevant thing. So that's why we don't, and the, the perfect example that Christian just brought up to is a good example why we don't talk about stuff like that. All right, folks, listen, before we get to your live Twitter questions, it is Thursday, which means it's time for us to talk a little bit about what is opening this week, brought to you by our friends at AMC Theaters. Now, we talked about one film opening this week on Tuesday, but there's another film going into wide release. Natasha, tell us about it. 
Although it already came out in very limited release a few weeks ago for Oscar consideration eligibility, the new Leonardo DiCaprio film, The Revenant, goes into wide release this weekend. While exploring the uncharted wilderness in the 1800s, legendary frontiersman Hugh Glass, Leonardo DiCaprio, sustains injuries from a brutal bear attack. When his hunting team leaves him for dead, Glass must utilize his survival skills to find a way back home to his beloved family. Grief-stricken and fueled by vengeance, Glass treks through the wintry terrain to track down John Fitzgerald, Tom Hardy, the former confidant who betrayed and abandoned him. Christian, should people be looking forward to The Revenant? Yes, very much. It was in my top ten of the year, and it deserves to be. It is gorgeous. It has incredible performances. Um, It is a survival tale. It is a revenge tale. It is some of Leonardo DiCaprio's best work. Um, I don't think he's going to win this year, but he certainly has a shot to do it. I also think Tom Hardy is another guy that I don't think he's been getting the recognition for this role. I think he should. Um, and Interatu, man, he's a superstar. He's a superstar director, and you, you, it's, it just has this gritty, raw feel, and I believe the fact that he shot the whole thing in natural light it, and see it in the theater. Mm-hmm. That's the, you have to see this movie in the theater. It's not that you won't be able to take those performances back too, but you get the ultimate experience by seeing this movie in the theater. So yes, go see it, Mark. You really get locked into the environment, you know. And right that that opening shot is just it, it's just so brutal the way this movie starts and all through it, it's like you're just locked in to the story this is telling, which is a pretty simple story. It's a revenge plot. I think DiCaprio should win Best Actor of the Year for this. I think the bear is definitely the best bear I've seen in a movie <laughs> all year. Pretty sure that's a new category. And Tom, mm-hmm. yeah, he's going up against Poe for Best Bear of All. <laughs> time next year <laughs> seeing Tom Hardy in this movie and it's not just even though it is a revenge movie about two guys you have a great well-rounded cast in here as well Donald Gleason just a great example of that as well as uh is it Kieran Hines is also in the, no not Kieran Hines no, uh, no Will Poulter uh Will Poulter yeah Will Poulter is also in the movie phenomenal job by him and uh yeah this definitely is something I echo Christian thoughts you should see this movie in the theater it is unlike anything I've ever seen before, and it's not that often that you get to say that about a movie, I felt like I was there. I felt really cold watching it because you're in freezing temperatures the whole time. My one question is, I'm finally looking at these two posters. How does Leo get such a perfectly groomed mustache? How does he get the landing strip in there in the middle? Is that the way his hair grows? Or that clearly somebody got it waxed for that poster? Because Tom Hardy's got a full one going all the way through. It was the bear. The bear. The bear claw. Bear claw. Bear claw. It was the yep. bear. Gotcha. <laughs> All right, folks, listen, I said we would save a little time at the end of the show for your Twitter questions, and it is time for that right now. Once again, tweet into us at Collider Video. Natasha, what have you picked out of the Twitter sphere? All right, well, speaking of gorgeous looking movies, Anthony Rodriguez asks, What is the most gorgeous looking movie, in your opinion, of all time? Oh, man. Um, House of Flying Daggers uh, is like that in Hero, actually. Hero ah. 2 is like. Like every single freaking frame, the way I've never seen, like Christian was just talking about the Revenant, how the use of natural light is like something you've never seen before. House of Daggers, the use of color, or uh, uh, here I should say, the use of color is like something I have never seen before. It is so vibrant and rich, and every single frame of that movie is like a, you could take any cell from that movie and hang it on your wall as a piece of art. I mean, it's just a gorgeous film. What about you? The Fall. Uh, Damn it, you took mine. Yeah. Damn yeah. it. Tars- I was going to sound the, smart. Tarsum's best, man. I yeah. Mean, he, it, is, it is gorgeous. It is like watching. It's like going to a museum and like the, the paintings are just coming alive. And the story I thought was really incredible too. But the, that movie. And he also did a movie that I think is pretty. It's a maybe guilty movie pleasure to me is, is The Cell. Uh, not, uh, yeah, The Cell. The, the one Cell with, 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 with uh, Tarsum yeah. Singh, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. The same guy who did yeah. The Fall. And, um, and that movie, again, the, the Cell itself, the films, whatever, but it's, again, the way that that. Dude shoots, and I know you like Mirror Mirror very much, but um, love Mirror Mirror. <laughs> but uh, the fall to me, yeah. So now that he took one, do you got a backup one? I do have a backup one, but we're going back. We're gonna wind the clock back a little bit, all the way to 1960. I think 2001: A Space Odyssey. Man, the way that movie, mm. everything about that movie, every the way that the shots are composed, the way that it's set up, the particularly the last. 30, 45 minutes of that movie is just so mesmerizing to watch. And I wasn't on anything when I watched it. I watched it stone cold, <laughs> sober, drug and acid free as all you kiddies should be. It's a phenomenal achievement. I still think it's Kubrick's crowning jewel. All right, what's next? All right, Todd Kleinheins writes, how many hours a week do you watch movies and spend <laughs> in theaters? Ooh. So wait, uh, how many hours do week. we watch movies? A week. In total or just, it just in, in a theater? I think both. I think okay. he's asking both. Okay. I probably spend on average 
on average, there's some weeks a little bit less, some weeks a little bit more. I'll go on an average five hours. I'll say it will be my, if you go across the board, probably five hours a week. I'd say it has to be. We, we usually see it two to three a week. So anywhere between and, and movies at home, I'd say six to eight. I would, yeah, I'd, I'd say six to eight hours just in a theater per yeah. week. Uh, and then at right. home, uh, who knows? I mean, sometimes I'm just, you know, watching sports all weekend. Sometimes I'll watch HBO and Netflix four times. So it can go, I'm going to say, between eight and 12. So let's say an even 11. Because yeah. I have a problem. Because like I, I, I was looking through a stack of that. I need to see uh, what's the, the Beach Boys one. The uh, Double Love Impact. and Mercy. Love and Mercy. Yeah. You have Double Impact, Double right. <laughs> Love and Mercy I have. And I'm like, I need to watch that oh, movie. Oh, dude, it's great. Oh, so I know. Good. I know. Yeah. So good. But I have a problem. I went and I wa- and I just I go to reach for it. And my left hand just grabs Empire Strikes Back. And I watch <laughs> it. So, <laughs> it's like every single time. I was like, I've seen Empire Strikes Back more times than anyone should. You know what you do? You got to keep it not next to Empire Strikes Back. Put it somewhere else. All right, what's next? Okay, Max Galaxy writes hi guys nice haircut john Woo! out of Aww. curiosity if someone could make a film about your lives what genre would it be oh horror <laughs> <laughs> comet slapstick comedy yeah. uh did black comedy maybe dark comedy yeah i mean if you ask my ex-girlfriend it's probably a suspense thriller um mm. if you're asking me i would hope it would be somewhat of a comedy maybe a dramedy is what yeah. i'll say mine would be an action adventure that's what it would be. I can't back that up in any way. <laughs> anyway. We need a good writer. Today. We need up. a good writer, a really good writer to make <laughs> yeah. it that. All right, what's next? Okay, Joshua Howell writes, which upcoming jungle film do you think will be better, Jungle Book or Legend of Tarzan? You know, okay, here's the thing. You'd asked me that a few weeks ago uh, before the new Tarzan trailer dropped. I would say easy because I had seen the D23. Okay, let me go back a year then. Before I'd seen the D23 footage, if you just said, hey, there's a new Tarzan movie, new Jungle Book, I probably would have said Tarzan. Then I saw the D23 footage. I'm like, no question asked. The Jungle Book is going to be better than some new rehashed Tarzan film. Then I saw the new Tarzan trailer. I got to tell you, I know Schnepp wasn't thrilled with the new Tarzan trailer. I really was impressed. I liked it. The last five seconds, they should have chopped off. But I really did enjoy that trailer a lot. I'm still going to say the Jungle Book. But it's a lot closer than it was a few weeks ago after I saw that trailer. What about you, Christian? Yeah, it's still a Jungle Book for me. Uh, but I agree. I think that the, the trailer absolutely put, the, put it on the board. Because it would have been like, come on, who even, who even cares? But, but the fact that that trailer did resonate and looked a lot like a better version of Lords of Greystoke, which I really I like I really Lords of Greystoke too, yeah. Um, but I'm also curious, and I know it's not this year, but I think that, uh, what a question could be is what's the better Jungle Book movie? Is it, well, that's, is yeah. it John Favreau's or Andy Serkis? Well, Andy doesn't come out until next year, though. No, right? it doesn't come out until like, next year. So if it's, if it's as far as this year's Jungle movies, I think it's Jungle Book. I think it's Jungle Book in a landslide. It's not even close. It's adorable that Tarzan showed up to compete, but I think that that trailer <laughs> impressed me because I had such low expectations, and I didn't know what to expect with Jungle Book and that footage blew me away so it's it's Shere Khan all right what's next okay Joshua Howell asks do you see any true contenders for the best actor Oscar outside of Leonardo DiCaprio is it Leo's year finally yes no. nobody else is even being nominated no, no. no. It, it's actually probably not even going to be Leo it is, oh, is yeah. this, I, I'd say the odds on favor right now is going to be Michael Fassbender for for jobs I mean look the movie think what you will about the movie and a lot of people were were a little bit mixed on the movie a lot of people enjoyed it but it wasn't great some people didn't even like it but the performance Michael Fassbender gave in that movie has captured a lot of people's attentions. And now, even beyond that, Leo might even be in third. That's what I'm saying. Because there's because yeah. there's also Paul Dano in oh. Love and Mercy that's getting a lot of attention. But some people are arguing he might be a Best Supporting Actor mm-hmm. kind of thing. But who would you put a... Eddie Redmayne. Eddie Redmayne, Eddie Redmayne for Redmayne The Danish Girl? I, I think it's it's a two-man fight, and I think it's Eddie Redmayne versus Michael Fassbender with Leo kind of looking in like this. I don't, I don't what think... What a shot. I, a, I, can, like, got, I won't be got, shocked if they call He's got a shot. That's what I'm saying. It's a three-man. Whoever four and five are just going to be like, thank God we're here. Um, <laughs> but I think that the three people... People are going to be Fastbender, Eddie Redmayne, Leo. With uh, I'm going to say Fastbender takes it, um, but yeah, I think Fastbender's probably. But Redmayne, take it. just because Redmayne won last year too, he's probably actually going to hurt a little bit. I, I, yeah, I think the Academy. It's so unfair how they do this, but they they really very rarely would do back to backs, even if somebody deserves it. Which Eddie Redmayne certainly his performance is in the conversation. You last also, actor to win back to back. Tom Hanks, very good. Hi. <laughs> um, I, you know, you could throw Johnny Depp's Halloween mask in there for Black Mask because, uh, you know, all joking aside, he was phenomenal. He in was that very movie. good in the movie, and I yeah. think would deserve an Oscar nomination. Um, outside of that, I just, I still think it's Leo's year, man. I really do. All right, last question of the day. Okay, Michael Harian writes, "Hey guys, love the show. Will there be Collider T-shirts soon? Fans would love it." Yeah, well, I'm wearing one. You and. <laughs> 
You in particular have been on my case for like a year about yeah. No, I'm, a it's, bring on the filthy shirt would sell like hotcakes. Yeah, you have no idea how many people have asked me for either bring on the filthy shirts. Damn it, Dennis shirts. Or, um, now, John. Or, yeah, now John! we have that. Uh, that would be an interesting. Yeah, actually, we we have had conversations actually with our new parent company, Complex Media. Um, they've actually they come to us and say, hey, maybe we should look at putting some merchandise together and putting some T-shirts together. So, uh, I would say I, I don't know that it'll be this week or this month, but I would say yes, it's definitely going to happen. There will be some uh, some uh, collider video T-shirts becoming available. Well, it's not a real merch store until you get beer koozies. Just so you know, yeah, yeah beer koozies. Yeah, most with of Natasha's it. face on it. I would that drink would that. Like I would drink that Coors Light. Yeah, there we go. It's getting questions. weird, guys. Getting weird. <laughs> that that didn't actually mean to sound weird at all. Hey Natasha, <laughs> I drank your face last night. It's delicious. Hey. Thank you. <laughs> but John, <laughs> <laughs> call that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks, that'll do it for us for this installment of Collider Video. Thank you so much for joining us. Listen, don't forget, go and vote for Lemium, number one. And also, make sure you visit our friends over at AMC Theaters. Go on over there, check out amctheaters.com for all of your theater, showtime, and of course, your movie ticket information. Don't forget to click the subscribe button, become a subscriber to our YouTube channel, click the thumbs up, like it, share it on your Facebook page, share it on your Twitter page, become an evangelist for Collider Movie Talk. I want to thank the guys sitting at the table with me. First of all, sitting on my left, Mr. Mark Ellis. Mark, where can people find you in your unhealthy Coors Light addiction? My very unhealthy <laughs> addiction to both drinking faces and Coors Light is going to be in Baltimore, Maryland tomorrow night. I'm doing the Horseshoe Casino shows one night night only on Friday. I'm back in one of my home states of Maryland. Very excited. On Twitter and Instagram, Mark Ellis Live. It's no longer the other one. It's a new year. It's a new day. Mark Ellis Live is the handle. And I'm getting a whole bunch of requests for people who want a shirt of Mark Ellis's face with the words, tell that to Conja Club on it. I think that's I think that's a shirt we got to get done. that people would request that. <laughs> Sitting over here on my right, Mr. Christian Harloff. Christian, where can people find you? I'll be taking off my Mark Ellis's parole ankle brace a little later on. Uh, <laughs> at Christian Harloff, both Twitter and Instagram. And make sure you watch Collider Jedi Council. Yep. That is today. It's myself, John, Mark, and Tiffany. We are, There's some big Rogue One stuff that happened this week, some rumors, some uh, character stuff. So make sure you tune in, and we'll be talking some Star Wars. And, of course, our lovely host today, back from her vacation, Miss Natasha Martinez. Natasha, where can people find you? <laughs> you guys can find me on Instagram at Natasha A. Martinez and Twitter at Natasha Lexis underscore. And, of course, you can just simply follow me on Facebook and on Twitter at John Campia. And keep your eye out for my novel, The Pride, coming out soon. I'll give you all the details about where you can get that pretty darn quick. So that'll do it for us today, guys. Thanks so much for joining us. For Collider Video, my name is John Campia. And until next time, bye-bye. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.